apologize for starting late or being the cause for us starting late. Last week, in class, the question was asked, after we had read, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And we suggested and made the point that when they didn't want to be scattered, they were doing the opposite of God's will, because God's will was for them to be scattered. And so God scattered them. The question was then asked, if I, Lee, think that this has any application to us now. Specifically, it was something about the church, to which I replied something like, I wouldn't apply it to the church, but if there were a nuclear fallout situation, I would suggest that it would apply then. I retract my answer. When I was done saying it, I thought to myself, something about that just doesn't sound right. And it wasn't the nuclear part that I had a problem with, although I wouldn't enjoy that. So, then, in my pursuit of knowledge, I did something that I occasionally do, and that is I wrote somebody else that I trust who is a thinker and has thought about these things. I wrote this. Lee Tosti, that I am he. What am I missing to Rick? Good day to you. Happy Christmas soon. I cannot wait to see what you got me. In the meantime, here's a question. Are those who live in the time of or under the new covenant obligated to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth? I've always assumed that we are. And in fact, right up until I answered it last week, I was pretty much assuming, yeah, we are. But as soon as I answered it, I thought to myself, I'm not so sure that's true. I've always assumed so because, number one, the covenant of Genesis 9 is before or outside of the law of Moses, and it was the law of Moses that was nailed to the cross. In other words, Genesis 9 wasn't nailed to the cross. Not necessarily. That's not the wording of Colossians. Some of the same, and some of the same restrictions are explicitly recorded in Acts 15 that are in Acts 9. And so the whole of Acts 9, or Genesis 9, 1 through 17 must still apply today. That's what I've always just kind of ran with. But either I was having a brain freeze then, or I'm having one now and thinking that the be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth is neither explicitly stated nor, and I was a little redundant there, implicitly necessarily implied in the new law which is the law we live under. For many years, I was, I don't know if I was taught this, I don't think I was, I just thought this. I thought that there was the law, so this is, this is Genesis 1, there was the law that God gave to man, and then in Exodus 20, at Mount Sinai, there's the law of Moses, and then there's the cross, and in Acts chapter 2, we have the law of Christ. That's what I always thought. And here's some law down there. But that's not actually really what happens in the flow of things. There's Genesis 1, and there's law given. Law for everybody. Genesis 9 would be one of them. And at the same time, well, in Exodus 20, there becomes this law. It's an additional law, and it's only for the Jews. So here we have the law of Moses for the Jews only. Then there's the cross and the law of Christ. Okay, so we'll put two little arrows there. Very nice. Now... Colossians will state that Jesus took away the law of Moses. Right. Now, but that would seem to leave this law here because, it, because well, just because it's, it's still there. Here's law. There's still law for the Gentiles over here, right? The, the law of Moses is added to that, if you will, or at the same time, contemporary is what I should say, not really added to it. Okay. So, this is, my thinking was uh, based on some misunderstandings, some misapplications. In showing you what I'm about to show you, I'm actually doing two things. <laughs> yeah, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Two things, but it's too late now because I can't change the PowerPoint. His reply, top of the morning to you, sir. Merry Christmas as well. I also cannot wait to see what I got here, which means he didn't get me anything. <laughs> I do agree 
with the overall principle of Genesis 9. So he's, he's kind of saying there, you know, yeah, Lee, what you said about Genesis 9 kind of still applying, but actually he won't agree with me or he won't agree with that part of me. He will agree with where I ended up, okay? And Rick is not inspired. He's not inspired, but we bounce ideas, or I bounce them off him. <laughs> he never bounces anything off me, except for I'm wrong. But I wonder about the whole of Genesis 9 being applied today, and about the way to apply some of these principles, even if they are binding. He'll down here, he'll write again, even if. So there's some uh, ambiguity, if you asked him. In your thoughts, in your thoughts, is there some ambiguity? He would say, yeah, yeah, there is. All right. For example, Genesis 91 views Noah, actually his children, in the same light as Adam was viewed in Genesis 1.28. Because of the flood, the earth is once again in need of populating. The condition has been fulfilled even as the rest of Genesis and the rest of the Old Testament books show, compare Genesis 10 and 11. But even if these conditions still apply today, exactly how many children are we required to have? And do these conditions apply rigidly? in every family, regardless of income disparities, health of mother, father, resources to care for them, etc., etc. I think not. I don't know of anything that even hints about the number of children each family must have. I don't know of anything that says the family must continue to have children until their ability to bear ceases. I do believe the, Old Test the New Testament and Old Testament emphasizes quality over quantity in these matters. Further, even in Genesis 1 and 9, the charge to fill the earth would go beyond the preview of a single family, it seems to me to start with a very small number, but to include the contributions of all who would come after. Now, all that to get really right here. The fact of capital punishment is clearly stated in Genesis 9, but it was not stated earlier in Genesis. The same is true of eating meat, as far as I can tell. But their way of handling capital cases differs markedly from that of the New Testament. Example, Romans 13, 4, an authorized agent, not a personal agent, or the next of king, Genesis 4, Numbers 35, etc. This is probably a sea of mud. The short of it, I share your present final conclusion. Here's what I'm, here's what I'm saying, and it's, it's clearly illustrated right here. Genesis 9 does talk about capital punishment. But in Genesis 9, up and through the Law of Moses, and even for some time apparently with the with Gentiles, the ex executor, the executor of capital cases was the blood avenger. And that could be anybody. Now, let me ask you this. If right now, Somebody killed my son. And I took it on myself to go after that person. Would that be lawful? No. Why not? Because God has ordained government. Because Romans 13, so if 13.4 says government. So if I came back here, this is an illustration, if I came to right here and said, but this says, everybody in here clearly sees, wait a minute, you're, in this case, you're going to the wrong law, right? And if I also said, here's the nuclear fallout, we've got to go everywhere, be fruitful and multiply the earth because it says so right here, I would have done the same fallacy. I would have done the same thing wrong. In Matthew 28, what did Jesus say to them. Remember his last words. Teach them to observe all that I commanded you. Colossians 3.17 Whatever you do in word or deed do all in the name of Jesus. I don't go to Genesis 9 for anything. I might go to understand something to get a definition, definition. but I don't go to Genesis 9 and say here it is, this is why I'm doing this. Okay? So to answer that question, I re-answer that. I take back my left. I, I could be wrong now and was right then. I don't think I am wrong now. I, I don't go back there. I don't say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth because of what is said in Genesis 9. No, i got to stick sometime after Acts 2. And if I can find, be fruitful and fill the earth and, 
yeah, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth after Acts 2, well then, then I'll say, this is what I'm doing, okay? Am I relatively clear? I can tell some eyeballs are like, Lee, you lost me, or I disagree with you. I can't tell which that is without you saying, and I suspect that some of you will not say. That's fine. So I've just re-answered my question. The reason I'm going through this is for two reasons, to say, yes, sometimes I change. Even the last week, this week, I changed. I said, no, that was, that was wrong. And the reason why I'm really bringing this one out is because it would be a wrong approach to where we get authority. Okay, that's, that's one reason I'm bringing it up. I will also say this. This is probably a sea of mud. <laughs> now, he's actually referring to what he has written. Okay? Um, but he says up here, I wonder about the whole thing. And then, uh, and do these conditions apply? Basically, what I, I want to, what I want to say here is, sometimes confusion or what I mean by that is lack of certainty, lack of certitude. You're, you're, I'm confident here. I'm com look, book, chapter, and verse here. Over here, hmm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of wrestling with this one. I don't know everything, and that's okay. I mean, we want to strive toward knowing everything God has revealed for us, but it's okay. I might not know it. And I'm guessing somebody, even in this room, might have said, yeah. my father-in-law states, I do know, I do believe the Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament emphasizes quality over quantity in the number of children. I happen to agree with that. But I'm guessing somebody in here would not have said that. They would have said, the New Testament emphasizes quality and quantity. I, I would ask Yeah, right. I, I would too, but I'm sure that, I mean, there are people out there that have 19 children, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that, although I'll dial it back to 10 children because they think God obligates them to, right? Okay, so I need to be very careful when I'm looking at them, and I hope that they're careful when they're looking at me, and we all have to have some humility, we all have to be patient, and we all have to be very careful not to criticize, well, you have 19 children <laughs> and you only have 10 children, whatever the case might be. Um, I'm done with what I wanted to say. Uh, so those are the two things I did. I, I retracted my statement from last week and I threw in, I also threw in, I need to be careful when I'm looking out. See, you know, some people have different understandings of this. And there's room for us to work together in that. John, I know you want to say something. Yeah, I, well, I have two things. Does Rick always email you at 4 o'clock in the morning? Yeah, that, that'd be one thing. I, I was going to ask him about that. No. Okay. And he also puts three or four spaces between his sentences. And you couldn't shorten it up? No. Oh, oh, oh just there, if you, if you, if you, here, There's actually, I went back and clicked on this. Three, four spaces? The, the, the second question I have really is more serious. Yeah. Um, do, do you... Do you think the Earth has filled? Yeah, that's a poor argument on the list. I mean, is, I know Say it again. that's a poor argument on the list. <laughs> this condition has been fulfilled. I don't, I don't think you're, you're remotely qualified to know whether that's true. I don't. I don't. I know you're not pursuing that sort of a thing. But yep. several years ago, I heard something I couldn't believe it. So I started playing around with the numbers, and it kind of had to do with the square footage in this room and the number of people that we were allowed to kind of put in here. Uh -huh. And it worked out to like two and a half feet per square foot. Okay? And if you take seven billion people in the world and divide it by two and a half square feet, guess how big of an area it would take to put everybody in one spot? Texas. Texas? Try the island of Hawaii. Okay. The big island. That's it. Every person in the world, now it would be very uncomfortable <laughs> but just in terms of scale, I think you can get everybody on the island of Hawaii in the entire world. Well, is the world full? Far from it. Well, using that parameter. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, obviously, you people cannot survive like that. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that, you know, these people that go out there and, you know, rally for population control and all this other stuff, they're crazy. There's, there's plenty oh, of room yeah. in this world for more people. Yep. So, 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else, anything else from this? So what I've done here is retracted my... I'd go to Genesis 9 for authority for what I'm doing. Only in a nuclear fallout, right? In the event of a nuclear fallout, I'm not going to go to Genesis 9, but I said last week I would. So I'm retracting that. That's what I'm doing. And I'm also saying, look, there's... There, he, he, this is probably a CMR. He's referring to what he wrote, but there is... Obviously, you can look out there and say there are good people... Christians who have different understandings of this, and we just need to be, I need to be careful. Okay. Uh, so I have some questions. Yep. Um, are you, you're saying that the, the law is provided in Genesis 9 continued for the world as it ran in conjunction with the specific law for the Jews. Yeah. I don't disagree with that. There's some things that I'm now struggling to reconcile about that. Okay, so they're supposed to be fruitful multiplying, and the Jews are supposed to be killing them off. One thing that I just find odd. Whatever. Talk to God. Um, yeah. Another th another thing is, um, we I'm trying to clarify this in my mind. We have no instance of any law in the law of Christ that, by its own nature, just carry forward. Yes, there are incidentals. He reestablished a point as part of the new law, but there is nothing that pursues on through. Because the thing, the thing about the, the argument for um, capital punishment is that he explicitly provided an example of a change there. We know it was this way, but now it is this way. Like, you've heard it said an eye, and a, an eye for an eye, a tooth for two, but now we're doing this instead. So that was like an explicit, there is, you know, there's a difference here, a distinction. Is there anything that we can assume was not addressed that therefore we assume has no distinction? Um, you know, we're not supposed to do the sacrifices anymore. He said so. You know, we get that from the New Testament explicitly. So, is is there any is there any Old Testament, whether Genesis nine law or Mosaic law, that we have in our heads that I have in my head that we're like kind of still practicing, but it's not like deliberately pointed out. I I would say if there is, you need to. You said that you used the word assumption twice there. Um, I, I get the wrestle that you're having. I'm not going to try to answer all of those. Sure. I will only counter or respond with teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you to do. I commanded you. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. And the Lord, when he's teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, isn't referring to Genesis 9. Like, like if, if Jesus hadn't bothered to point out the whole honor your father and mother thing again, would that be relevant to us now? I, I would say no. Okay, okay. You know, and I mean, that, that's kind of the, the, what I'm coming up with. <laughs> you're right. Um, yeah, like, uh, but, but, if he hadn't pointed out, if he hadn't said, um, if he hadn't said, well, see that falls under the law, just being taken out of the taken out of the way, you know. Because uh, we, we we are now permitted to sow two different kinds of seeds in the same field, and wear mixed fabric. fabric clothing. Although it doesn't ever say you don't have to anymore and should not. Um, but again, all that falls under the umbrella. Even if it doesn't say it, it still falls under the umbrella of the, the whole law. So if it's not explicitly clarified that a fault is that it is no longer relevant, right. but that it remains relevant. Yeah, the one who asserts must prove. Um, and, and you prove by looking for a book, chapter, and verse. Statement, command, example, necessary inference. I may do this. I must do this. I am permitted to do this. Those are three three categories. I, I may and permitted. So the three categories are I must not, I may, and I must. And for all of everything we do will fall under that. Um, is there a logical description of is there a description of how the, the logical default is that way that we would assume that it has changed and not that it hasn't? He didn't explicitly mention a change, therefore, by default, it has passed away. We we look for the, the approach is not necessarily I get what you're asking, but the approach is 
what do I find I have authority to do? And everything else is not authorized. It may have once been authorized, and so in that case, you would say, well, it once was, but it no longer is. But I don't go looking for what was authorized and what is not. That's not actually the approach that we should take. I, I am simply bound to looking for what is authorized. Now, I can figure out some other things, but I am, my approach is, what is authorized? What may I do? What's the fine print? We look for the fine print. Which, which is actually very helpful because that way he doesn't have, uh, you know, we'd have to have truckloads books. of books. You shall not. You shall right, you not. shall not, you shall not. And every time somebody come up with a new technology, you shall not apply this new technology to that, <laughs> you know. One more thing, I promise I'll make it easy on you. Realize eschatology, or is that what it's called? Yeah. Okay. So they say the law, you know, one of the things I learned from you is that they think the law of Moses and the law of Christ ran parallel to each other. Both were enforced. Yeah. Okay. Do they then also believe the law prior to the law of Moses would be involved here? Should realized eschatologists logically be trying to have children left and right because of Genesis 9? No, they, they have no revelation. They, they have are no revelation all anymore. That's right. It gets cut off altogether. <coughs> right. Okay. <coughs> but all these laws, and now we've got none of them. Say it again. All those laws, and now we've got none of them to go by. Right. Right. Okay. Sorry. That's fine. Before I ask again and get myself into trouble again, I'm going on. All right. Now that we've... I, we're probably not going to get into Genesis. Well, we might. Uh, I had some fun. Wait a minute. I'm not done having fun with this one. Right. Here are some stats from Genesis 5. I know we already talked about these. These are all the numbers. Genesis 5, okay? So, order of birth. So, you know, here's the order of birth, right? And that's the way we're used to reading them. Um, I'm not going to read all these numbers. Age at death, 930, 912, 905, 910, which makes Enoch. I say he died, you know, he didn't die, but this is their order of death. Adam is first, Enosh, or Enoch, oh it should be, uh, Enoch is, is second. Enoch died second, although in the list he was born seventh. Right. He, he didn't die, I keep on using that word about it. Um, you know, Seth is three, and then, and then uh, who's the other one? Um, Lamech. I believe, yeah, Lamech throws it out of order also. Lamech is born ninth, but he dies eighth. <laughs> okay? So that's just my, kind of mildly interesting. The next chart is from Genesis chapter 11. And what you understand from this one, look who died second to last. Look where Abraham is. Abraham's born last but dies before Shem does. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, fa it's fascinating. Um, You're wrong. Say it again? You're wrong. <laughs> right. Well, I could be. I've done the numbers a couple times. I didn't get this from anybody else. I just added, you know. But there's numbers to remember, so I could be off in one or two of them. Um, here are the numbers. The years they died after the flood. Peleg is 340. By the way, he was born sixth and dies first after the flood. Wow. In his days, the earth was divided. Nahor, so here are the numbers 350, 70, 393, 427, Arkachad, just love saying that, Abram, 467 years after the flood, Silah, Shem, and then Eber, who is what, second in the list? Or, uh, Shem? No, he's after... Uh, yeah, he's, he's a little bit down there. Anyway, um, which is interesting because this is like <laughs> life. You know, we, we want them to be born one, two, three, four, five, six, and then naturally that's the way they die. But wham, somebody, something happened to one guy, something happened to another guy. So in another, the, these lifespans are very long, but in one sense, things were kind of 
God's in control, but things were random and they had life, right? All right. Now, Genesis 12. Before we get into Genesis 12, we have a reminder. I want to do this occasionally when I can. There are two big pictures. The most important big picture that is told in the Bible, the most important big picture that's told in the Bible is God saves the world through Jesus. All right? So I don't want to diminish that. We'll put that up on our chart this way. And we are... Now, you can pick your prophecies, okay? But in Genesis 3, he's first mentioned. This is the next time. The text we're in, now he's mentioned cryptically here. But now we understand that he's narrowed. And all the people of the world, I mentioned the Savior back in Genesis 3. Now it's been 2,000 years or whatever. And now I'm picking Abraham. And then you'll pick Judah, Genesis 49. And then you'll pick David. I know he, he picks Isaac and Jacob, but I'm going right to Judah, then David, then Bethlehem, and then during the Roman times. The other big picture that is also being recorded. Now, the biggest picture is that Jesus is going to be born, but that story is nested within a greater story, a greater context. And the greater context is men just keep on messing up everywhere. And God reveals himself, and then they forget who he is, and then he's got to reveal himself, and we see that all the time. Two interrelated areas of concern, knowing who God is, knowing what God expects of him, her, or them. In the beginning, everybody knew who Jehovah was and what he wanted, and it didn't take them very long. By the time of the Exodus, which is when we're reading, now we're reading about Abraham, but Moses writes at the time of the Exodus, okay? So about the time of Abraham, God is gearing up to do what we're talking about. At the time of the Exodus, there were many gods. Remember, we read Joshua. Joshua said there, Terah had many gods, and there were many moral standards. Um, here's an example of the functions of myth. One of the functions of myth is to make sense of the way the world is. Myth gave the Greeks their sense of what it was to be Greek, since in myth they were confronted with the basis of their moral and ethical understanding. They read Homer like we read the Bible, literally. That was the, every schoolboy memorized Homer, and that's where they get all their ethics from the Iliad and the Odyssey and all the crazy myths that we read about. Well, they were, you know, those myths are starting to be formed about this time the time of Abraham, a little bit later. Plato writes in 400 B.C., we Cretans call Zeus our lawgiver. They're looking for a law. They get it from a god. While the Lacedaemon, uh, Lacedaemon, Lacedaemon, where our friend here has his home believe, they claim Apollo as theirs. So you've got your god giving laws, and we've got our god giving laws. It's chaos out there. And so when it's chaos, that means there's darkness. And so God's got to come down at this time, one of the many times he'll do it, and say, I'm Jehovah, and this is the moral code. And I know it won't happen for 400 years in our text, but it's happening when Moses writes our text. Shall we get into the text? <laughs> All right. Genesis 11. The whole earth. I'm in the wrong verse. Verse 26. Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. These are the records of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran became the father of Lot. This is setting us up for the next two or three chapters and also chapter 19 a little bit. Oh, there's this guy Lot. Okay, now we, we're going to have to follow him for a minute. Verse 8, 28, Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his birth in Ur the Chaldeans. Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's, Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and, uh, Milcah and Iscah. Sarai was barren. She had no child. Now, why is it saying that? Because this is setting us up for the next <coughs> 10 chapters or so, right? Verse 31, Terah took Haran, Abraham. Okay, 
I'm going to do that over and over. And in my defense, the author of Hebrews calls Abraham, Abraham, when he refers to this account right here, okay? So if the author of Hebrews can refer to Abraham as Abraham when he was still technically Abram, then I can too. And an example of finding book, chapter, verse. <laughs> okay. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and his son, Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. I refers to this last week in Acts chapter 7. Stephen will say, God had already appeared to Abram in Ur. Now that's not recorded here, but Stephen knew it. So I'll take it on his authority that he's right. They went as far as Haran, settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. This brings us to the command and promises from God. Abraham is chosen. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house, to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse the one who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And Abraham said, No way. Where do you want me to go from? Some historian writes that Ur had become an important city in Mesopotamia near the end of the third millennium, so around this time. The governor of Ur brought... The, to the, ci the city to great prominence. He took the titles king of Earth, so on and so forth. Thus founded the third dynasty. This period was one of great peace and prosperity, the high point of the city's existence. They say that in 1800, you were to move to London. In 1900, you were moved to, to move to New York. And in 2010, you were supposed to move to Bangkok because that's where the money flows. Well, right then, you were supposed to move to Ur. Everything's fine. And God says, leave. What? It's, I got it pretty good here. Oh, did you notice you said, leave your relatives? You want me to leave my relatives? And back then, when you are going to go on a journey, it was not exactly like everything was peaceful everywhere you went. To the land which I, I don't even know where it is right now. And you want me to leave. Is that how the story went? So Abraham, or Abram, went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. Faith obeys. That's what faith is. God says, obey. Jump. How high? Faith obeys even when it's unreasonable. And when I say unreasonable, I mean it two ways unreasonable as in without reason and unreasonable as in against reason. In fact, in Romans chapter 5, I believe it is, or maybe it's chapter 4, it'll say that Abraham hoped against hope. It made no sense. This, this just, when you looked at this purely from a human standpoint, you say, this is the opposite of making sense. It's not even like, oh, okay, I, I don't have any, no, no, the, if you put it in the scales, it's a negative. I guess it's up there, right? It's a negative. So why did he go? Why did he obey? What was he thinking about? Hebrews 11, 8 says, by faith, Abraham, when he was a call, when he was called, obeyed, by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And when he went out, not knowing where he was going, by faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. That, what were you thinking, Abraham? Well, I understood that as great as Ur was, there was something better, and that's what I wanted. I never kept my focus off of it. Comment. This is the danger of becoming self-reliant to the extent that you don't have time to think about God. Why suffering still exists for good people. Are you saying...
saying, if it doesn't make sense, you won't do it? Becoming right. that kind of self-reliant? Yeah. I can't figure it out. Exactly. Exactly. Right. That's the idea of, you know, I, I have all of you. I don't have to take any risks. I don't have to exercise my faith. I'm responsible for my income. I got my income. Successfully built what we have. You know, I mean, what a, to the extent where you have to stop and question what on earth is it that I, how, how do I think this is going to resolve itself well? And sometimes it doesn't, at least for a while. <coughs> right, yeah. It'll come up in a little bit. Yes, good point. Uh, the nation is fulfilled in Exodus 20 when, when they come in to, or out of, Egypt. He brings them to Mount Sinai and he says, here, now you're a nation. <laughs> You've got your own laws, right? The land is fulfilled by Joshua 21. We'll turn there and look at it and just stare at it. And let us let our eyes remember that just in case somebody ever comes in here and says, no, it wasn't. We'll remember Joshua 21. Verse 43, the land, Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give their fathers, and they possessed it and lived in it. And the Lord gave them rest on every side according to all that he had sworn to their fathers, and no one of all their enemies stood before the Lord, before them, the Lord gave their other enemies into the hand. Not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. Okay? And the earth was blessed. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go there. But in Galatians 3, Paul will quote this very text right here. Verse Genesis 12, 3. In you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And say, you've got to believe in Jesus Christ. Because this fulfills that. Peter will say it in Acts chapter 3, verse 25, when he's talking to the leaders of the, the Israelites. He'll say to them, you have to repent because of this verse right here. So we don't have to wonder when it was fulfilled. I will bless those who bless you. I think of, was it Jacob that went... And for some time, he spent time in his father-in-law's house, and everything he touched turned to gold. And then Joseph, everything he touched turned to gold. The one who curses you, I will curse. Here comes Balak and says to Balaam, or do I have that backwards? Balaam is the problem. Balak comes to Balaam and says, curse them. And it doesn't happen that way. So these might be literal fulfillments of this. So, now they go to the land. Verse 5, or excuse me, verse 4. <clears throat> they went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Faith is not a young man's only lot in life. <laughs> if I could use that pun. Right? No, this guy's 75 years old. John Bosworth is almost there. Houston. It doesn't matter who. We're all going to be there sometime, Lord willing, right? Okay. Abram took Sarai, his wife, she's 65 at this time, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions with, possessions with the accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, they sent out for the land of Canaan, and thus they came to the land of Canaan. And Abraham said, Here I am. Where's the fulfillment? Give me my land. What are all these people doing here anyway? It's my land. Well, is that how it went? No, because sometimes we have to wait. Uh, don't like that waiting thing. Verse 6. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the land to the Oak of Morah. Now the Canaanite was in the land. Now this is interesting. The promise is to Abraham, you're going to get this land. He's in the land, but who else is there? The people. Now, do you think this what would what what would this do to Abraham when he shows up and here are these people in this land? Would he be like, oh this is great? Or would he have some thoughts about I wonder what's going to happen? 
I would suggest that this is a test of his faith. I don't know that for sure, but I do know this. God was up to the task of getting rid of the people who were in the land. Wait, this is my land. Uh, there are people here. God, how does this work? And God says to him, I'm up to the task. Are you up to the test? Can you just trust me in this, Abraham? By the way, this will become relevant in chapter 14 because when the four kings come along, and clear out the land, what could Abraham have done? He could have said, this is what God's doing. This is how God's clearing out the land. But that's not what happens. Okay. Now, God is up to the task of getting whatever occupies the occupier out. God can do that. The question is, do you have the faith, right? So, I got a lot of ugly in me. God says, Lee, I want you to, I got a promise for you. You're going to be a better person someday. And I look at me and I say, well, <laughs> what? But I got a lot of ugly in me. And God says, I know that, but I'm willing to work with you. I can get rid of the ugly if you'll just put your faith in me. I'll turn you into what you want to be here. Okay. Abram passed through the land as far as Shechem to the Oak of Morah. The Canaanite was in the land. Verse 7, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai, or I, however you want to say that, on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and he called upon the name of the Lord. Abraham journeyed on continuing toward the Negev. If you look at your footnote, that's south. He keeps going south, south, south. Now, I want to point this out real quick. Abraham was a righteous man, right? Right. Noah was a righteous man, right? Right. What did Noah do when he came out of the ark? Built an altar. What did Abraham do when he got to the land? Kept on building these altars. I'm going to suggest there's a pattern here. What you'll see is righteous people do the same thing generally speaking, right? There's, there's a hope. Oh, look, here's a righteous person. That's what they're doing. And and the righteous person over here is going to be doing the same thing, right? That's the pattern. And so when you see a righteous person, if you want to be righteous, what do you do? You follow them as they follow the Lord through his word. Abraham journeyed on continuing toward the south. It's a good place to break we have a meeting, a business meeting. I will break. Anybody comment or question on the little we talked about from the text? Lord willing, we'll cruise right into verse 10 next week, which is uh, good, exciting stuff throughout this whole section.